We're here at the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum with Larry Wood, who is the museum's director of education, and we're standing in front of the SR-71 Blackbird. This is a museum piece, but it still has done some things that no other aircraft has ever done. Well, it still holds the speed record, at least what the Air Force will tell us that it did, and that's 2,198 miles an hour. Holds the altitude record for air breathers at 85,000 plus feet, which is way up there. And uh, what I like to tell everybody is, it's really the last airplane designed with a slide rule. So when you talk about Kelly Johnson and the Skunk Works, this is the epitome of the Skunk Works. It's a magic, magic airplane. All right, now, some of the missions this thing flew still have statistics that are amazing just to listen to. The amount of film, the speed with which it could make distance, the range, uh, all this stuff. One of the cameras we have uh, has three miles of film in it, and it's, of course it's not 35 millimeter, it's about eight inches wide. And uh, it would take off, uh, refuel, and then would fly a two hour mission, air refuel, fly another two hour mission. And it takes just a little bit over an hour, a little bit less than an hour actually, to go from Los Angeles to New York. So your two hour mission would have been to take off in Los Angeles, fly to New York, and then turn around and fly back. Then air refuel, and then do it a second time. That's pretty slick. Now, the guys who flew this plane were on a par with the astronauts in terms of their training, equipment, and everything else. Pretty close. They, they actually wore a space suit, uh, more like the one the Mercury capsule guys wore, in that it's silver, it's a pressure suit because you're up so high. The airplane's pressurized, but it might not be pressurized. And so they did that kind of stuff. But there's terrific stories by the guys that flew the airplane. We've had the groups come here, uh, try to get them every year around Father's Day, and, and we'll put on a little symposium here in the museum with them. And they'll tell us how it was to maintain the airplane, what it was like to fly it, some of the things they did, how it was designed. And it's really fa fantastic to listen to them talk. Cirrus Design's Vision SJ50 single-engine personal jet offers exceptional fuel efficiency flexible seating for up to seven, advanced avionics, and all the Cirrus safety features you expect, including the Cirrus airframe parachute system. With its V-tail design, the Cirrus Vision is technologically advanced, yet engineered to be simple to fly, to allow owner pilots more lifestyle pursuits than any other personal aircraft. Learn more about the Vision SJ50 at cirrusdesign.com. Tell us what a typical mission would, would go like. How, what was the preparation? How much time did they have before they launch one of these things? How much notice did they scramble them quickly or plan it way ahead? And what did they do? Well, it took them a long time to get ready because they would put them in a, an, on 100% oxygen early. They'd get them used to the pressurization. They'd be in their spacesuit. They'd get acclimatized. They'd feed them steak and eggs before they left. All the same things they do for the astronaut. It would start uh, 24 hours before getting ready. Then they put them inside the suit and, and uh, air condition them to get them ready, stick them in the airplane, and, and finally get it started. Uh, in Okinawa, they used to start them inside the hangar, and you'd see the doors open open and this black thing had come out and take off and disappear. And then when they land, they, they have to stay in the airplane for a significant amount of time to let the airplane cool off because it gets so hot on the outside. Plus they had to kind of uh, depressurize themselves and work the process backwards. So much like going on a space shuttle ride, uh, except you didn't stay airborne that long and you didn't go quite that high. But, but magic stuff. And of course, it's no guns, no missiles, no uh, rockets, no uh, bombs. It was They were alone, unarmed, and unafraid taking pictures. And we know that there were over 4,000 surface air missiles fired at the airplane, and it never got hit. There were some crashes, but those were always something that went wrong. The enemy never got one, ever. Well, now, this plane was built in 1960. The technology of the time, it was it went through some upgrades over the years, but you have things on static display here that you still don't know what's inside of. Oh, well, of course. What, we don't know what the paint's made out of on the airplane, and I don't think the Air Force is likely to tell us. We have electronic countermeasures boxes here. Some we know are active, some we know are passive, but what they were looking for, I don't know. The only thing we do know is about the cameras, and uh, they're kind of magic. If you own a Cirrus today or if you are considering the purchase of a new or used aircraft, consider this. Avidyne, in conjunction with the country's leading Cirrus sales and maintenance facilities, has launched the G3R9 program that combines the purchase of a late model, low time Cirrus aircraft and the addition of the Avidyne Integra Release 9 avionics suite for much less than you may have thought, and certainly much less than purchasing a brand new aircraft. G3R9, combining the best airframe, best engine, and best avionics for the best value. Why did they stop flying the SR-71 if it can do these things that nothing else can do? 
Well, think about what you had to pay two lieutenant colonels and a tanker and a tanker crew and special fuel and all that stuff to fly it. It was well over a million dollars a mission and uh, or more. And they said, uh -uh. so it's cheaper to put a satellite up there. You don't have to pay to feed it, clothe it, house it, buy it a commissary or any of the rest of that stuff. And it stays there wherever you want it to put. And that was the biggest difference. Plus, there's no danger of you know, somebody getting hurt if it does break down and you don't have to worry about recovering the pilots if it does end up someplace and something bad happened. All right, now all that being said, I understand that all the SR-71s that are out in private hands right now are on the condition that they could be called back into service at any moment. Oh, that's true, and obviously many, many of the exhibits here are on loan from the Air Force Museum, so they could be called back at any time by the museum or the Naval, U.S. Naval Museum uh, or the Marine Corps Museum. If they want them back, they can get them back. And yeah, all the pieces are here. Are they going to call them back? I don't know. It'd be a lot harder to put them together now. But I think NASA still has a couple that they're hiding someplace that we won't know about. But uh, who knows? Well, one thing's for sure. If you're looking up in the sky watching for something black, it'll probably be going too fast for you to see it anyway. Well, you might be able to see it, but it's not going to be there very, very long. And there are great stories about that. And it's you got to get those guys to tell you those stories. They're great fun. Well, there are some books available, and we'll, we'll try and refer our, our viewers to those. Larry, thanks for filling us in on some of the history of this great machine. Sure, this is a cool place. Thank you very much for coming.